Hey everybody, this is Jordan again with the Picture Monk Podcast, and welcome to the third episode of a photography podcast where we talk about everything awesome in photography. Uh, let me just start out by saying that I want to say thank you for those who have listened and those who have subscribed. It uh, really means a lot. I've been looking over some of the numbers, and it's really kind of cool to see that just, you know, two episodes in, this is the third episode, but two episodes that have been live, it's really kind of cool to see uh, everybody that's that's listening and all the subscribers out there, and also some of the reviews that have been left. Uh, there's only three reviews, but it's it's kind of cool to see that people are looking at that sort of thing, so... Let me just start off by saying, speaking of reviews, if you uh, if you do like the podcast, if you don't like the podcast, it doesn't matter. Just go review it. I don't I don't care if you give me a one star or five star. Just it lets me know what I can improve on and what you do like. So uh, head over to picturemonk.com slash podcast and that'll redirect you to iTunes and from there you can leave a uh, one one star or five star review and just let me know what you uh, what you think so far. All right, now that we got that out of the way, we can uh, we can look into some of the news that has been going on in the photography realm, and there hasn't been a whole lot that has been put out, but one thing that has been released uh, with I think within the last week is Amazon has actually started a service to allow you to store an uh, an unlimited amount of photos. Uh, if you are an Amazon Prime member, this is kind of a cool thing uh, for anybody that needs to get to the, you know any of their photos right offhand. Uh, another, there's other services like you know Dropbox has the same thing, Google Drive does the same thing. You can store all your photos in there, but you do have a cap on both of those services. But with uh, Amazon Prime, if you already pay the $99 a year, you get to have access to unlimited photo storage. Now, at our household, we use Amazon Prime mainly for watching videos, but we also, when we do order stuff, we get the free two-day shipping. And let me just say this. This is not a, uh, you know, f- affiliate thing that I'm saying. I'm not getting paid to say this, but uh, I just really like the Amazon Prime service. I think it's a really great bang for the buck. But if you uh, if you do have his Amazon Prime, you can actually store your photos on uh, on their servers now. Now, I I think that this only applies to popular uh, formats like JPEG and maybe PNG, but I'm not positive on that, Um, but definitely JPEG. Uh, And I I did try one thing before I started the podcast, and that is to store RAW files. Um, I tried to to store a RAW file for Canon, that's a CR2 file. I tried to upload that to their server, and it wouldn't let me. It said the file, it couldn't recognize the file type. So uh, I wanted a way to, if you wanted to, store the, store raw files on their server. So what I actually did was I changed the extension of the file. Instead of saying CR2, I changed it to JPEG. Uh, and then it let me upload the, um, the file to their server. Uh, it's not going to give you a preview of the file because I basically just told it that it was a file type, but it wasn't. But it will allow you to store them on there. So if you have a really critical file, like a, a really great photo that you never want to lose, and you want to keep the raw file, just change the extension, pop it up there, and you'll you'll have it forever. The only thing that you need to do is that when you do want to get it back off of the server, you'll have to download it again and then change the extension back to CR2. Now, I just did that, and it let me do it. So I don't know if that's going to change in the future with Amazon. I, I have no clue, but, you know, that it works as of right now. But if you if you do have an Amazon Prime member, go check that out. Uh, it's just called Amazon Photos, and you can uh, see for yourself how, how well that works. So if you have a family and you got tons and tons of kids, kids' photos, pop them up there and you can get to them from anywhere and you don't have to worry about ever filling that up and having to pay for extra storage somewhere. So that's it for about photo news. I really couldn't find much else. Uh, I saw some other things, but nothing was really catching my eye as far as, uh, you know, popular things coming out. I know one of the, one of the biggest things is that people are doing reviews of the, uh, Canon 7D Mark II. Um, it looks like a nice camera. But I, you know, it's it's still a crop sensor camera, so that's about the only kind of photo news that I've that I've seen come out recently. All right, so for this podcast episode, I kind of want to concentrate on night photography. I was out walking my dog last night, uh, last Saturday, and I just looked up at the stars and thought I need to cover some night photography tips and tricks and stuff like that. I really like doing night photography. It's kind of cool to to just you know 
especially in the winter because it's the the air is so much clearer it's not it's doesn't have as much moisture in the air so you get a better visual of of how the stars look i just really like throwing on a coat going outside taking my camera and seeing what i can get with with night photography so i'm going to run through these 10 tips for night photography and we'll uh, and i'll, I'll kind of expand on these uh, the first tip is to scout out your location before you shoot now what this does is it lets you envision all of your possible places and compositions that you could possibly get when you go out there to take photos if possible i would do this the the day before the night before possibly uh, the day of if you can get there in time and just kind of scout out the location see what see what kind of is there and it'll allow you to to pre-visualize everything and and know when right when you get there at night where to set your camera up doing the research on this kind of thing is is super important um, and it'll also allow you to check if you're if like let's say you're wanting to get night photography and get like a, a milky way or, or just star photos in general it'll also allow you to see exactly on a map where you're going to be so that way you can check like a service called the dark sky finder uh, that'll allow you to check the light pollution in the area and will show you how much light pollution is there so you know you know if you're going to get a really really dark sky and bring out all the color or the, bring out all the brightness in the stars or if you're just going to get there and it's just you take a photo like a 30 second exposure and you're just going to see orangish lights coming out from the horizon uh what that what that is is light pollution from nearby like cities and airports and stuff like that so that's the first tip and it's a really really important tip uh the next tip is kind of obvious but it's always use a tripod don't think you're going to go out there and get your camera and turn it on you know high isos like 6400 uh 12 uh 12800 don't think you're going to get good photos trying to handhold that thing uh you really need a tripod you need a really good sturdy tripod preferably one that can be weighed down and the the kinds that do that have uh, a little hook on the center column of the tripod which allows you to hang like sandbags uh, even your camera bag if it's a heavy camera bag allows you to weigh it down give it more sturdiness you really need a good tripod I have gone through two tripods I had a Manfrotto uh, that I that I kind of went through and now I have uh, I can't remember the other brand I have uh, but it's not a popular brand but it's a really good brand it's it's actually stands up to you know dirt salt water and it's still still functioning so make sure you get a really good sturdy tripod really strong and don't uh, don't cheap out and and think that you can get one from Walmart that's you know twenty dollars and get really good photos where it's like not shaking you're it's going to shake because it's not made for that all right the next uh next tip is to get a cable release now a cable release is a uh a little remote that plugs into your your camera and will allow you to trip the shutter using that camera release this is really good because that means that you don't have to touch your camera when you're out there and trying to get really good night photos you want to minimize the amount of time that you touch your camera obviously you want to change settings but pressing the shutter button will uh, pressing the shutter button on the camera will introduce more movement than you want so when you have a cable release you can basically just plug it in change your settings and just snap away using that cable release and you're you don't ever have to touch touch your camera they also have uh, wireless ones uh, I know for my Canon 6D I can use the EOS remote that will allow me to use it as a wireless shutter release the drawback with some of those things are battery life um, for, for the EOS remote if I were to use that I would have to turn the Wi-Fi on on the camera keep my phone on Wi-Fi mode and both of those are going to be draining battery life because the Wi-Fi is constantly on, constantly talking to each other. So I always prefer just to get a cheap cable release. You can grab them on, uh, grab them on Amazon for, uh, I think I got mine for $8, um, and it just plugs right into your camera, and you'll be good to go. All right, step number four, shoot in manual mode. You're not going to get really good photos if you go out uh, at night and try to shoot on automatic mode or even aperture priority mode that's that's the my main mode that I use on my camera um, I'm not going to get good photos when I shoot that if you, you want to use aperture priority um, 
I would recommend turning it to aperture priority, seeing what settings the camera gives you uh, as far as ISO. Well, you can set your ISO to 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 low um, to 100 or so like that. I try to keep my ISO around 100 when I shoot night photography just because I don't want any noise. But um, you can still go up. But I would start off at, at ISO 100. See how well you get, uh, how well the camera interprets the light there see what the camera gives you as far as shutter speed and aperture and everything take those settings put them into the manual mode and go from there you're not going to get it right on the first try it's either going to be really dark really really bright you know you might see that your focus is off that kind of thing so make sure you always shoot in manual mode you want to have as much control over that final image as possible so that's a uh, that's tip number four always shoot in manual mode tip number five this is another really important one. Always shoot in RAW. Now, RAW format is the native, uh, the native file off of your camera. It's where nothing has been done to it, but it also provides you with more information in the final file. So, when you bring your file into Lightroom, you will be able to adjust way more detail than you would in a JPEG because a JPEG is compressed. So a JPEG is, it loses data because it's compressed so much. A RAW file has way more data than a JPEG would. So when you bring it into Lightroom or Photoshop uh, and you crank that exposure up and down or the highlights up and down, the shadows up and down, you're going to have more data and a better result for that. So always shoot in RAW. I always shoot in RAW no matter what, not just for night photography, but uh, make sure your camera is always set to shoot in RAW. Step number six, don't believe your LCD screen. So this basically means do not believe what you see on the back of the camera. Kind of gives you a good starting point to see where you're going, but do not believe it. So what I find when I usually take night photos is I'll take a night photo. Uh, I'll look at the back of the LCD screen once it's done taking the photo. And I think I nailed it because the photo looks bright. I can see all these, you know, nice things in, in the photo. The stars look really bright. But once I bring it into Lightroom, I see that the, the photo's sort of dark. And it's a little underwhelming from what I saw on the camera. Uh, this happens because of two reasons. Number one, the one the photo you're seeing on the back of the LCD screen is not the RAW file that we just talked about because the camera can't show you a RAW file. Uh, that is basically a JPEG preview of how the camera sees the photo. Might be nice to the to the eye, but that's just how it shows the camera shows you what it got. It's not how the RAW file is going to look when you get it back in, in Lightroom or Photoshop. The second reason it does this is because the LCD screen is actually, you know, it's a, it's a it's a lit screen. So since the screen is backlit, it's going to, your photo is going to look brighter than it really is. So even if you take a photo and you see that it's too bright and you start backing down your, your shutter speed, you know, maybe shot at 30 30 seconds and you back it down to 25 uh, 25 seconds it's going to be darker but you kind of you kind of want to try to make it more bright than it really is don't want to go too crazy but you know if it if you do see a little more brightness in the photo that's fine because you can always back that down there's only so much you can bring back from black uh the black space in the photo so don't trust your lcd screen play around with it i always try to get at least half a stop over of what the camera thinks is correct so if i think it's uh, if, if I look at it and I think it's perfect on camera, I might take another one and try to get it just a little bit brighter than it really is. So that way I'll, I'll have all of the information I need. I know that it's brighter so on the screen, so it should be right around perfect when I get it into to Lightroom or Photoshop. All right, step number seven is to download the Starwalk app. Now, this is not a paid endorsement. I'm not getting paid by Starwalk, but I really love the app. The Starwalk app is basically an app for iOS, and I believe it's on Android, uh, that allows you to see the night sky, how it looks right now, and how it's going to look in the future, see where the planets are, see where the Milky Way is, comets, satellites, uh, everything. It's going to show you where all that stuff is. So when you go out to take 
photos of the Milky Way, for example. Uh, you'll open up the Starwalk app, search for the Milky Way, it's pretty easy to find. Hold it up to the sky, and you'll see exactly where, as you spin, as you turn around, you'll see exactly where the full length of the Milky Way is going to be. So that'll give you a better idea of where you need to point your camera. It'll also give you the sunrise and sunset times, moonrise, moon, uh, the moonrise times, and moonset times. It'll give you all those times, so you'll know when and where to go out. Step number eight is don't be afraid to use a very low aperture and a very high ISO. So uh, when you use a very low aperture, uh, what it what you're basically doing is saying I don't want most of the background in focus. You want your whatever you focus your focal point is. You want that to be the most in focus, and it just kind of fade out. Well. Don't be afraid to use that because what that also does is it opens up the, the aperture of the lens and says, I need more light or I'm going to give more light to the sensor. And you need as much light as you can when you're taking night photography. So bump your aperture down to almost the lowest that it can go depending on the lens you have. So the lens you have might be a f4 lens. Bump it down to f4. Don't worry about it being uh, too shallow in the depth of field. You're, it, it's not going to matter that much in that sort of scenario. So use a low aperture because you need as much light as you can now and also in turn you need to use a higher ISO to get more light now when I'm shooting Milky Way stuff I, I keep going back to Milky Way stuff because that's just what I like to shoot I, I really like uh, the challenge of trying to get that but like let's say you're gonna shoot the Milky Way you need as much light as you can to bring out the colors in the Milky Way so a low aperture will let in more light and a high ISO, high ISO will uh, let in more light as well. Now, depending on what camera you have, the high ISO will introduce more noise to the camera or to your to your sensor. Some cameras handle noise better than others. Uh, Nikons are kind of an un, it's kind of an unwritten rule that Nikons handle noise better than Canons, but I have a Canon 6D and when I crank that thing up to uh, 12 12,800 um, it, I don't see as much noise as I would with my previous camera so it just depends on what kind of camera you have but don't be afraid to go too high because you can reduce noise in Photoshop and Lightroom uh, it's really easy to do there's others many methods on how to reduce noise so don't be afraid to go that high you need your goal is just to get the shot it doesn't matter what settings you use just get the shot and then we can worry about later trying to fix some of the imperfections that you might have have introduced using using ISO and, and, and composition and stuff. Alright, step number nine is if you have a wide-angle lens, use it. Now I hardly ever use any other lens beside a wide-angle lens when I'm shooting night photography. The wide-angle lens not only does it give you more field of view, but it will allow you to take a longer exposure without getting star trails. Now, if you want to get star trails, that's a different story. If you if you've, you've seen those photos where the stars are, you know, in a circular motion, going going across the sky, that's called, that's what star trails are. So, if you want that, then you need a longer lens. So maybe a 50 millimeter or or something along those lines that will give you less field of view and it'll also introduce more star trails. The reason this happens is because since the Earth is spinning. Uh, when you're zoomed into the sky, the Earth, the camera is going to perceive the Earth spinning faster, so you're going to get more star trails. When you have a wide-angle lens like a 10 to 20 or a 17 to 40 uh, on a full-frame camera, you're going to get less movement because you you have so much more field of view. So you can take a longer shutter speed, a longer a longer photo for uh, you know maybe maybe past 30 seconds. Uh, I, I believe. There, there is a rule out there that's called the 600 rule. Some say it's the 500 rule, but some, most people go with the 600 rule, um, where you take your, your, your focal distance. So maybe you're doing, a, you have a 10 millimeter lens. That's your, that's the widest you can go. You take 10 millimeters and you divide it by 600. And when you get, when you do that, you get 60. And that's this, that's this uh, longest you can go without introducing star trails. I've tried this a bunch of times. It's you're still going to get star trails. That rule is not really correct. <laughs> you can kind of go along those lines with with that, but you really need to kind of back it down. So go maybe if you have a 10 millimeter lens, you're going to shoot star trails. Maybe 45 seconds or 40 seconds. 
and you probably will see just a tiny bit of, of blur in the fo in the stars, but it's not going to be crazy. Now, if you have 50 millimeters, then you're you're going to see a lot of star trails very quickly. So, if you have a wide angle lens, use it. You want to get as much field of view as possible, and you want to be able to take longer photos as possible to try to try to bring in more light to the camera. Okay, step number ten. All right, step number ten, which is the uh, the last tip, and it's really not. It's really not a technical tip at all. It's a always bring a flashlight with you. <laughs> you want to do this for two reasons. It's going to be dark, so you need to you need to be able to you know see your camera settings where the buttons are in your camera, unless you're really familiar with your camera. See where all the buttons are, so you can change uh, change certain things. You also need to bring it for safety. That's a that's a simple thing. Um, and you, and one other cool thing you can do with a flashlight, which I tested out with uh, my photography partner, my dad. Uh, we went out to to shoot a um, uh, old shed at night, and when we got there, it was you know it was dark, but we were expecting it to be a clear sky, and it wasn't it wasn't that clear. It was clear while we were driving up there, but we got there and it was starting to be a, a cloudy sky. So. I had a small flashlight with me that I, I would use for that for that reason to see where buttons are on my camera. And so I set my tripod up in front of the uh, in front of the shed, got all my settings right, focused on the shed, and then I started to do light painting. Now light painting can is normally done two different ways. The most common two ways is um, you take a long shutter speed, take the light, shine it towards the camera, and you can like write stuff in in the sky or in the in the image with a, with a flashlight. A lot of people have done this. Um, it's actually kind of a cool thing if you haven't done it before. Um, but another thing you can do is that you can actually pinpoint what things you want to light up in your image. So let, for the for example for the shed, I wanted to light up the shed more because if I tried to get a longer exposure, my sky was going to be really, really blown out. Even though I was, it was at night, I was going to be a darker sky if I wanted to get the shed uh, brighter. So I was able to use a lower shutter speed and also get the shed in, in nice light. And this basically meant taking the, the camera, setting it on, I think I had it on a 20 second exposure. And once I tripped it, I would start shining the light over the shed and that would illuminate parts of it like the the side of it where I was really concentrating it on there was like a bunch of cracks in the in the bottom of the bottom of the shed I would really concentrate on that area there in, the, in that kind of range and when the photo got done the shed was lit up more than it would have been if I didn't light paint it so it's a really cool thing to do. You don't obviously you don't have to do it every time, but you know, always bring a flashlight with you. It's going to help with seeing uh, in the dark there, and it's also going to be safe. It's going to be a safety component, and it also give you more opportunities to get more creative uh, night shots. All right, guys, that's about all I have for you. I uh, hope you enjoyed the podcast. Uh, it's kind of a longer one than I thought it was going to be, but we had a lot of good things to talk about. So if you uh, if you want to head over to picturemonk.com slash podcast, be sure to give it a review. Uh, also head over to picturemonk.com and you can find a whole bunch of articles on there about many, many different topics. And also check out uh, on my Friday freebie section on picturemonk.com where I give away a uh, really cool photography, resource, photo, something. I give that away uh, every Friday. So check that out. I just gave away a, a cool photo that I took uh, at a train museum in North Carolina, in Spencer, North Carolina. Uh, There's a, a big warehouse where they had a whole bunch of red, uh, I guess it was old fire trucks, and had light coming in through the windows. And I just gave that photo away as a high-res JPEG. So you can uh, download it. You can print it. You can you know, put it on a website. You can market it. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can do whatever you want to as long as you don't sell it or represent it as your own so head on over to picturemonk.com check out all the cool stuff we got there and also rate the podcast and i hope you guys enjoyed it and i'll see you later